Hello, and welcome to the channel. When a man was arrested for assaulting two women, as well as being suspected of the disappearance of another, police in the small city of Woonsocket, Rhode Island, thought they had made their streets safer. That was until they learned two more women had gone missing, while their suspect was still in prison awaiting trial. They would soon discover an even greater threat walking among them. But before we begin today's video, if you're interested in all things true crime, please consider subscribing to the channel and turning on all notifications so you can keep up to date whenever I release a new episode. Also, give this video a like and leave a comment telling me what you thought, as it really helps the channel and I'd like to know what you think of today's case. Thank you, and let's begin. Today's story takes place in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. It's Rhode Island's northernmost city, boasting a population of 43,240 people, as per the 2020 census, making it the sixth largest city in the state. During the early morning hours of the 2nd of March 2003, various women were walking up and down the High and Arnold streets. These women were sex workers looking for clients to entertain. One of those women, Jane Smith, was there that night on the search for clients. At some point that night, an SUV approached Jane and propositioned her. Jane agreed to get into the van and together, the pair drove away. Emergency services would later receive several calls, describing a naked woman found lying in the street near an old wood mill. That woman, of course, was Jane Smith. She would be taken to hospital, severely injured, but fortunately alive police were able to speak with Jane to gather more information about what happened. She explained to them that after being picked up by the driver, she was taken to a secluded area near an old wood mill. Once they arrived, she got out the car. However, the man she was with had sucker punched her in the face. Jane would try and fight back, but was overpowered by the man, who with a screwdriver repeatedly stabbed her in the face, neck and torso. After his flurried attack, he got into his car and drove off, leaving her for dead. Jane described her attacker as being a white man in his 30s with blonde hair, black glasses, and a stocky build. She also noticed several tattoos on both arms. Police would investigate the area where Jane was attacked for clues, but besides the pool of Jane's blood, the attacker had left no physical evidence at the scene. Furthermore, there were no other eyewitnesses who saw the attack, leaving investigators with very little to work with. Fast forward to the 4th of April 2003. Just over a month since Jane was attacked, no further developments had been made in the investigation. Concerns grew when a woman came forward to report a missing person. The person making the report was the mother of 33-year-old Audrey Harris. Audrey, who was also a sex worker, who, like Jane, frequented High and Arnold Street. Audrey's mother would tell police that her daughter would usually stop by once or twice a week, but Audrey hadn't visited in the past three months. Naturally, Audrey's mother had become worried enough to raise concerns. At this stage, police had begun to suspect that perhaps Audrey's disappearance was somehow connected to the attack on Jane Smith. They would go to High and Arnold Street and speak with several of the working women in the area, hoping to extract any information they could get that could shed some light on Audrey's last known movements. Unfortunately though, none of the women police spoke with were able to provide them with any useful information. Because of this, investigators didn't have anything concrete that tied the two events together, other than both Jane and Audrey were working women who operated in the same area. A week later, on the 11th of April 2003, police were notified that another woman, Christine Dumont, had been brutally attacked. Police learned that she too had been in the High and Arnold Street area at the time. Police would visit Christine in hospital the following morning to gain an understanding as to what happened the night before. Christine, who was also a sex worker, was working the streets that night. 
Visibly shaken by her ordeal, she explained that she had met a man who picked her up and took her to what would turn out to be the same secluded wood mill that Jane Smith had been taken to. When they arrived, the man began hurling abuse at Christine and dragged her out of his vehicle before striking her over the head repeatedly with a tire iron. Despite being significantly smaller than her attacker, Christine said she attempted to fight back against the man but was unable to subdue him. Instead, she would play dead in the hopes that her attacker would leave her for dead. Fortunately for her, her gamble would pay off and the man would flee the scene. The description of her attacker was strikingly similar to that which Jane Smith gave to police. Christine told investigators that the man had a stocky build, blonde hair, and was in his mid-twenties to early thirties. Christine also said the man had several tattoos. After speaking with Christine, investigators decided to ask Jane to visit the police station again to see whether she could provide any new information. Luckily, Jane had remembered something new that she hadn't told police before. Prior to the attack, her client had visited an ATM to withdraw $100 in cash. She was able to tell investigators where the withdrawal took place. Investigators then obtained the CCTV footage and reviewed it in depth. Just before 1am on the 2nd of March, investigators observed a man withdraw cash from the same ATM Jane described. Furthermore, it was around the same time Jane said the withdrawal took place. When police reviewed the data from the ATM, they found that the amount withdrawn was $100. The man in question was a white male with blondish hair and a goatee. The description strongly resembled that which Jane Smith and Christine Dumont described. At this stage, the authorities were confident that the man they were observing was the same man who attacked both Jane Smith and Christine Dumont. Investigators then got to work with creating a photo array of men known to them who matched the description provided by the two women. Once complete, police took this to Christine, hoping she would be able to point out her attacker. As Christine scanned over the images, one picture caused Christine to stop in fear. She would burst into tears, pointing at the picture, telling police, that's the mother Kafka who attacked me. The man she was pointing to was a man named Timothy Scanlon. Timothy was a local to Woonsocket and was known to police after he had been previously arrested for possession of a stolen vehicle as well as larceny. Police then took the same photo array to Jane to confirm their suspicions. Like Christine, Jane's eyes stopped on Timothy, telling detectives, that's him, that's him. Detectives were now certain that Timothy wasn't just the man responsible for the attacks on Jane and Christine, but that he must have had something to do with the disappearance of Audrey Harris. On the 15th of April 2003, police would obtain an arrest warrant and track down Scanlon, where they would take him into custody for interrogation. Although the interrogation wouldn't last very long, as Scanlon refused to speak to investigators, opting instead to demand a lawyer. Because of this, police were unable to grill him for as long as they hoped. His silence wouldn't stop police charging Timothy Scanlon on multiple counts of first-degree felony assault on both Jane Smith and Christine Dumont, as well as being charged for two counts of kidnapping. While police suspected that he was also involved with Audrey Harris's disappearance, without evidence, no charges were filed in relation to her. At his arraignment, Scanlon pled not guilty, and his defence argued that he was actually in a consensual relationship with both women at the time of their attacks. While they conceded that Scanlon was with both women on the nights in question, they suggested that another person was responsible for their attacks. Timothy Scanlon would be refused bail and held in prison until his trial. Naturally, police believed the best chance of securing a conviction would be for both women to testify against him. Christine seemed to be eager to stand up in court and tell her story. She wanted to turn her life around and be a better mother to her children. She saw the chance to tell her story in court as an opportunity to achieve this goal. Jane Smith, on the other hand, was so consumed with fear that she refused to testify. Understandably, she wanted to put the whole experience behind her and attempt to move on with her life. With just Christine willing to testify, her testimony would be crucial in helping the prosecution secure a guilty verdict. 
while no trial date had been confirmed. Christine didn't care. She just wanted her moment, her chance at justice, a chance to move on and begin to better her life. However, that chance would never arrive. Over a year later, on the 3rd of May 2004, a woman would visit Woonsocket Police to report her sister missing. The woman would tell police that she hadn't seen her sister for approximately 10 days. This was highly unusual, as the woman would regularly be in contact with her family and children. What was even more worrying was the missing woman hadn't collected her state check. The missing woman was Christine Dumont. Knowing that she hadn't collected her state check, police recognised this as a red flag and immediately began to investigate where she could be. Christine's disappearance also shocked those working on the Scanlon case, given how positive Christine was at taking on her attacker in court. Police circled back to Timothy Scanlon. Despite the fact he hadn't left prison since his arrest, they hadn't ruled out the possibility that he may have made arrangements with someone on the outside to either scare Christine into hiding or something far worse. But when police investigated this angle further, they surprisingly learned that there was nothing to suggest that Scanlon, or anyone else linked to him for that matter, had been involved. Further investigation revealed that Christine had unfortunately returned to working the streets again, but this provided detectives with an opportunity to talk to girls working the High and Arnold Street to see if they had seen Christine and if so, whether she was with anyone at the time they believed she disappeared. But this sadly turned out to be a dead end, with the woman providing nothing new that police could work with. With no possible way to prove Scanlon was involved, and no information to suggest her disappearance was connected to the upcoming trial, police were now facing the worrying prospect that someone else was possibly involved. They also began to question Scanlon's involvement in the Audrey Harris case, wondering if this unknown individual was somehow responsible. A couple of months later, while America celebrated Independence Day, Woonsocket police would get their answer. On the 4th of July, James Nelson would report his girlfriend Stacy Goulet missing. He told police that during the previous night, while Stacy and he were out celebrating Independence Day, the pair were on High and Arnold Street. James really needed a smoke at one point, so he asked Stacy to wait for him while he went round the corner to see if he could get a cigarette from someone. When he returned, Stacy was nowhere to be seen. Assuming she went away for a moment like he did, James decided to wait for Stacy to return. When she didn't, he grew concerned. At least that's what James told police initially. Police weren't entirely convinced by his story, and so they decided to interrogate him as though they were accusing him of murdering the young woman. James would resist their pressure for a time, but eventually relented. He confessed that Stacy was actually a sex worker, and that James was there with her that night to keep an eye on her. While he did leave High and Arnold momentarily to get a smoke, upon returning to find her gone, he assumed that a John had just picked her up. As for why he lied initially, James told police he did this to protect Stacy's character. Police would continue to press him for information, but ultimately, they were satisfied that he wasn't involved. After speaking with James, investigators paid a visit to Stacy's mother, who confirmed to them that she knew of Stacy's line of work and actively tried to stop her from continuing. But other than what police already knew, which was very little, Stacy's disappearance quickly went cold. The situation by now was becoming dire. Three women were missing, all within the space of 15 months. One man is in prison awaiting trial, potentially involved with one disappearance, but certainly not for Stacy's or the prosecution's star witness. Desperate for any information, sting operations were set up on the 9th of July to nab John's looking to pick up women. The purpose of this wasn't to arrest the men simply for committing the act of looking to get their rocks off for a fee, but to speak with them to try and gather any information that they possibly could. Multiple men would be arrested during this time, but as with every other line of inquiry they went down, nothing of interest was gathered. It seemed as though police were railroaded at every turn, but on the 11th of July, police would receive an anonymous call that would swing the investigation back in their favour. 
Jocelyn Martell was attacked by a guy, and she fits the same category as the girls that are missing. She probably has information that you might want. Jocelyn Martell, a known prostitute, was easy to find, as she was currently in prison. Naturally, detectives pounced on this tip and went to speak with her. While she wasn't the one who came forward, Jocelyn was more than willing to assist, especially given that three women who worked in the same field as her had gone missing. She told detectives that roughly a month before the disappearances began, she was picked up by a man who took her to his home located on Cato Street. After going inside, the man locked the door, crept up from behind and applied a chokehold on her. Jocelyn fought incredibly hard and was able to free herself from the man's grip before successfully escaping. She told investigators that she suspected she wasn't the first woman to be attacked by the man. She then gave a description of her attacker. White, late 20s to early 30s, short hair. When detectives asked if she knew the precise house number where her attacker took her, she explained that she didn't know it, but she could describe it. She told them that the home was a white multi-family home, with green shutters and a white picket fence out the front of it. When detectives paid a visit to Cato Street, they were on the lookout for the home described to them. Thankfully, there was only one home that fit the description provided by Jocelyn, 221 Cato Street. With the location confirmed, authorities then pulled electrical company and criminal records to confirm the name of the person living there and to see if any police reports had been filed to the address. The criminal records would pull up the first result. A woman by the name of T. Morris had previously filed a complaint after claiming she had been attacked there. Detectives tracked down Teese, who was willing to speak with them and relive her experience. On the 15th of February 2004, Teese was celebrating her birthday and decided to go out for some fun. She paid a visit to her local bar and settled down to buy herself a drink when a man approached her from behind. Put your money away, I'll buy you a beer, the man told her. Not wanting to turn down the opportunity of a free drink, Teese agreed and the pair spent the evening at the bar talking. While getting to know each other, Teese never felt threatened by the person she described as an everyday man. Eventually, the pair agreed to go back to his house. When they arrived, Teese told detectives that she needed a napkin. The man said to get one from a drawer from the other side of the room. Unbeknownst to Teese, the man locked the door from the inside. As she opened the drawer with her back to the man, he lunged at her, placing her into a chokehold. Quickly, Teese realized that the man was not simply fooling around. His grip grew tighter and tighter, but Teese fought back bravely, scratching at the man's eyes, doing all she could to free herself from him. She would say, I couldn't get him off my neck. I couldn't get air. I'm grabbing at his eyes. I'm trying to get at him as I'm thinking to myself, this guy's got to get off me. Please get him off me. I pushed all the way back and bent his back on his stove. I went back with a lot of force, and I'm begging, I'm screaming, please, my daughter, I gotta see my daughter. He dragged me toward the door and said, If I ever see you outside again, I'll kill you. I will kill you. After this, the man threw her out of his home, and Tease fled, traumatized by the events. Given the description Teese gave investigators, police were convinced that the man who attacked Teese was also the same person who attacked Jocelyn. Both were choked, in a manner described as a WWE-style chokehold. Teese, like Jocelyn, had also been taken back to their attacker's home. It wouldn't be long before the electrical company came back with a name, 33-year-old Jeffrey Mailhot. Detectives run a background check, looking to see if he had any priors. Strangely though, Jeffrey's criminal record was squeaky clean, so they instead contacted the Department of Motor Vehicles, or DMV, to see if he was on record and also to get a picture of the man. Fortunately for investigators, the DMV were able to provide a photo of the man, and on the 15th of July 2004, they used his picture as a part of a photo lineup to Jocelyn Martell and showed it to her. She positively identified Jeffrey. Police then took the same line up to Teese, and she also identified Jeffrey as her attacker. With two positive IDs and circumstantial evidence building up, 
Detectives took this to a judge the following day, who agreed to issuing both an arrest warrant against Manhot, as well as a search warrant on his home. On the 17th of July 2004, police lied in wait outside of Manhot's home, waiting for him to appear. When they witnessed him stepping on the steps of his home on Cato Street, they swooped in and arrested him without incident. He was taken to Woonsocket Police Station for interrogation. With Malhot out of the way, detectives and forensic teams began the search of his home. They immediately noticed the orderliness of his home upon entering. Everything was neat and had its place. In the cupboards, drinks glasses appeared separated by distance, almost as though a ruler had been used to match the gaps in between them. Other items had clearly been alphabetized. From the outset, Jeffrey's home was nothing like you'd expect to see when searching through the home of a suspected serial killer. That was until they entered his bathroom. This room was nothing like the others that authorities had searched before. The bathtub was covered in grime and utterly filthy, and the rest of the bathroom was unkempt. One of the lieutenants switched on his torch and searched around and underneath the bathtub. Immediately, he noticed what appeared to be a dark patch underneath the bath and around the bathroom floor. Forensic experts then entered and sprayed luminol, lighting up a large patch on the floor when UV light was shone. Tests on the dark patch revealed that it was of coarse blood that had pooled around for a period long enough to seep into the cement-like grouting. Officers were now growing anxious as to what they had uncovered. Meanwhile, back at the interrogation room, Detectives got to work questioning Malhot. Initially, they would begin by looking to gain his trust, asking seemingly harmless questions to try and build a rapport with the man. But eventually, they would move to asking him about his history with sex workers. Jeffrey Malhot denied ever picking up working girls, although he would admit to seeing them around the High and Arnold Street area. But when asked directly about both Jocelyn and Tees, he claimed to have dated the pair before admitting having picked up prostitutes in the past, Jocelyn being one of them. The conversation then moved to whether he roughhoused women he was being intimate with. Jeffrey told detectives that he would on occasion choke them a little bit, but stopped short of admitting that he'd ever went beyond that. Detectives then showed Jeffrey Malhot the pictures of the missing women, Audrey Harris, Christine Dumont and Stacey Goulet. Jeffrey, who was already on edge at this point, reacted with fear, hands shaking at the sight of the three women. Detectives asked Jeffrey, What are you getting so nervous for? Because you think I killed these three girls. Jeff, I never said they were dead. We only told you we were investigating missing girls. With Malhot showing signs of extreme stress, one of the two detectives left the interrogation room. The other detective, alone with Jeffrey, began to tear into Malhot, piling the pressure on him. When the other detective arrived back into the interrogation room, Malhot was ready to tell all to the pair. Jeffrey Malhot would go on to confess to killing Audrey Harris, Christine Dumont and Stacey Goulet. He told them that he had, quote, something inside of me, which he couldn't control. He would go out to High and Arnold to pick up a sex worker and take them back to his home. Once inside, he would lock the door behind them and sneak up to apply his trademark chokehold. He told officers that while he had done this many times to multiple women, only the three missing girls would die. When he ended the life of his first victim, Audrey Harris, he said that it was never his intention to kill her, but to just have sex with her. He began to choke her until she was unconscious. Jeffrey saw that Audrey was still breathing, and so he placed a pillow over her face, suffocating her. Jeffrey woke up the next morning, describing having a hazy feeling, as if what had happened was nothing more than a bad dream. But when he went to his bathroom, he saw Audrey's lifeless body lying there. Initially, Jeffrey was terrified, but when he realized that nobody was knocking on his door looking for Audrey, he assumed that he'd gotten away with it and even convinced himself that he could do it again. Audrey's body would remain in his home for two days while Jeffrey decided what to do next. Suddenly, he reminded himself of an episode of The Sopranos, where one of the main characters dismembered their victim before disposing of them. Using a handsaw, he took Audrey upstairs to the bathroom where he would begin to do this. 
He confirmed to detectives that he did the same to both Christine Dumont and Stacey Goulet. When the media eventually caught wind of what Malehot did, they dubbed him the Rhode Island Ripper, or the Sopranos Killer. What was perhaps the most disturbing part of his confession was that he told interrogators that the part that gave him the biggest rush was not the act of killing, but locking them inside, knowing to himself that there was no escape for the women. When he was asked what he did with the bodies after he had finished dismembering them, he said that he placed them into garbage bags and threw them into trash containers. Despite the detailed confession that Jeffrey Malhot gave police, the DA of Woonsocket wanted independent evidence to link Malhot to the murders, and so police got to work searching for the missing women's remains. They would trace the disposal truck route and confirm that the bodies were likely to be in the town's central landfill. A team consisting of police officers and forensic teams were then sent there to carry out a search of the site, searching an area 100 yards wide, 100 yards long, and 20 feet deep. While the search was underway, investigators also found the handsaw used to cut up the women, tracing it back to a Lowe's retail store, where officers recovered CCTV footage of him purchasing the tool. Ten days after Jeffrey Malhot was arrested, the 27th of July 2004, a patrol officer was raking through the mountain of trash when he tore open one of the bags. Inside, the officer found what appeared to be the remains of a petite human female. The remains were taken away for further testing, where they would later be confirmed to belong to Stacey Goulet. Furthermore, the blood spatter found at the home of Jeffrey Malhot was confirmed to have contained three distinct bloodstains. These bloodstains were later confirmed to be a combination of both Audrey Harris and Christine Dumont's blood. To this day, neither of their bodies have ever been found. Jeffrey Malhot would be charged with three counts of murder, one count of assault with intent to murder Jocelyn Martel, and one count felony assault on Tees Morris. On the 16th of February 2006, he would plead guilty on all counts and would be sentenced to two terms of life imprisonment, plus an additional 10 years. He currently resides at Rhode Island Maximum Security Prison in Cranston. He'll be eligible for parole in 2047, at which point he'll be 77 years old. The news that Jeffrey Malhot was responsible for some of the most shocking acts experienced in Woonsocket left many people surprised that he was capable of such monstrous acts. To many, Jeffrey was just your average American, he had an interest in motorcycles, wrestling and bodybuilding. In high school, he was too shy to provide a graduation photo, with the graduation book listing him as camera shy. A neighbour of his on Cato Street even reportedly accused the police of setting Malhot up, and his landlord would call Jeffrey a nice kid who paid his bills on time. Even police noted that after his arrest, Malhot was polite and quiet and yet he was able to hide his true self to those closest to him, only allowing himself to become the monster he was once he locked the door behind the women he lured into his home. To me, this case makes me wonder just how many Jeffrey Malhots we've passed in the street, smiled to, or wished a good day. Thankfully, he's where he needs to be now. In case you were wondering whatever happened to Timothy Scanlon, on the 28th of July 2005, he was found guilty of the attack on Jane Smith and sentenced to 50 years in prison, with a further 20 years suspended. He would appeal his conviction all the way to the Supreme Court of Rhode Island, who would deny his request to reduce his sentence on the 4th of November 2011. Thank you for watching, and a special thank you to those who support me via channel membership and through Patreon. Needlem Fur, The Alabastard, Mr. Jenny Benevolent, Amanda, Krista, Omniblast, Shamu Dog Smith, Angie Thompson, Holy Holy, James Harrington, and Rory Herbert. Members and patrons receive early access to audio only versions of my videos, as well as other exclusive content. If you're interested, check the links in the description. Until next time, take care and goodbye. For now.